Greetings, mortals. Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and scion of a beloved intellectual property. Why is Disney so good when it comes to film musicals and so lousy when it comes to television musicals? It's like the studio has a split personality, and one side is saying, yeah, let's do these great stories with memorable characters and top Broadway composers providing the score. And the other side is just shrugging its shoulders and going, oh, whatever, I'm just going to throw together a few kids on the Disney Channel payroll and some pseudo-pop songs and a paint-by-numbers plot and get Kenny Ortega to direct the whole thing. I mean, what else is he doing these days? And thus we come to the latest iteration of that formula, Descendants. It's kind of inevitable that Disney would jump on the Monster High bandwagon. I mean, this isn't the first time they've done a multiplayer crossover with their canon. Or the second, or the third, or the third and a half. So, yeah, those were harmless enough affairs, and this probably started out as the same, but then Ortega was signed on to direct, at which point, of course, its reworking as a musical was a foregone conclusion as was its appearance in this court. So let's examine the case of Descendants, shall we? Once upon twenty or so years ago, Belle and the Beast got married, joined all the Disney properties in a single realm, and were elected King and Queen of the United States of Oradon. You don't vote for kings? All of the villains were rounded up and condemned to exile on the Isle of the Lost, where they're kept contained by an anti-magic barrier. But now Belle and Beast's son Ben is turning 16 and is about to inherit the throne, and he's decided his first royal act will be to allow the villain's offspring to come to Oradon on a transfer program. Who are their parents? Corella Deville, Jafar, Evil Queen, and Maleficent. Oh, Maleficent! She is the worst villain in the land! Hey, at least Ben was diplomatic enough to avoid suggesting Gaston's kid. Anyway, Belle pointedly reminds her husband that he's in no position to argue against the whole giving someone a second chance thing, so he reluctantly agrees to the scheme. The children in question, who have the two obviously derivative names of Mal, Evie, Jay, and Carlos, are introduced bumming about their slum of a home singing Sin No. 1, a quasi-dubstep monstrosity called Rotten to the Core. This sounds like the worst Dance Dance Revolution track ever, to say nothing of the lyrics, which aren't so much lyrics as random couplets joined together to fit the music. The past is past. Forgive, forget. The truth is, you ain't seen nothing yet. After that embarrassing display of look how trendy we are, Mal is confronted by her mother, Ma... Kristen Chenoweth? Alright, movie, I must stop you right there, because Kristen Chenoweth is a lot of things. She is an amazing singer. She is a gifted actress. She is totally going to kick ass as Velma Von Tussle in Hairspray Live, and I will fight anyone who says otherwise. What she is not is a statuesque contralto embodiment of all evil who strikes terror into the souls of all who behold her. I mean, look at her. Even with the horns, she's barely scraping the top of Dove Cameron's head. And while Cheno is obviously having the time of her life hamming it up as the bad guy, it's not a kind of ham that works for Maleficent, who had kind of a cold menace even in her most over-the-top moments. This Maleficent has so little chill she can be used as evidence for global warming. I want that wand! Do you? Hadn't heard. We get a rundown of how the adults feel about the whole transfer thing. Maleficent wants Mal to steal the fairy godmother's wand and break down the anti-magic barrier so she can rule the world and have revenge and all those other shouty villain motivations. The evil queen wants Evie to nab a rich prince, Cruella wants Carlos to stay her smothered mama's boy with a pathological fear of dogs, and Jafar needs Jay to... steal merchandise for him? Since when is Jafar a fence? Disney, did you seriously just confuse your villain with your hero? No matter, having established the life lessons our four main characters will learn, follow your own destiny, you're more than just a pretty face, look out for other people, and be kind to small fluffy animals, Mal gets her mother's spell book, Evie gets the magic mirror, and the villain kids hop into the limo for Oradon. (laughs) 
Look, just because you're aiming your movie at eight-year-olds doesn't mean your teenage protagonists have to act like them. It's salty like nuts, but it's sweet. Like, I don't know what. Let me see. Ugh, I think eight-year-old was an overestimate. At last, the exchange students arrive at Oradon Prep, as indicated by the cheapest-looking elite private school sign ever, where they are welcomed by the headmistress, and you can probably guess by her loosely modernized costume who she's supposed to be. Welcome to Oradon Prep. I'm Fairy Godmother, headmistress. Hold up a second. Can we please give these characters actual names? I mean, Snow White's evil queen and the Beast's human form have semi-canonical names already, but even if you don't want to go with those, pick something. Having everyone refer to each other by vague titles is awkward. Unless you're going for an Into the Woods type deal where the characters represent broad archetypes rather than individuals, but that's a little more psychologically complex than this movie can manage. The villain kids are introduced to Ben and Ben's girlfriend Audrey, the story's officially sanctioned mean girl. She's also Aurora and Philip's daughter, so that makes things rather tense between her and Mal, on top of the whole semi-witty banter-flirting thing that Mal and Ben have going on. Having established our primary love triangle, the villain kids are palmed off on Doug, Dopey's son. That is literally how he introduces himself. Hi guys, I'm Dopey's son. And sin number four, I realize this whole premise is children of Disney heroes and villains and all that, but the way everyone is introduced as so-and-so's kid ends up being rather forced. It's like nobody cares who the characters are on their own terms, but what beloved Disney property they're associated with. Oh, my mom's Aurora. Sleeping Beauty. Chad, Prince Charming Jr. Cinderella's son. Hey guys, I'm Lonnie. My mom's Mulan. Since the primary theme of Descendants is supposed to be you're not defined by who your parents are, this ends up sending a bit of a mixed message. Using the magic Google mirror, the villain kids learn that the fairy godmother's wand is on display at the Museum of Cultural History and Disney Canon Easter Eggs. Luckily, the enchanted spinning wheel is also on display, so Mal is able to magic the security guard asleep, but while searching for the wand, they come across the Hall of Villains and are a bit taken aback when they see that their evil parents, who are exiled for being evil and go about proclaiming their evilness and who, in one case, actually has the word evil in the only name she's ever given, are are portrayed as, well, not very nice. I'll never forget Mother's Day again. Mal stays behind to be all conflicted about wanting to live up to her mother's expectations, and Maleficent's statue comes to life for a little piece of weird I like to call sin number five, evil like me. Don't you wanna be evil like me? Don't you wanna be mean? Don't you wanna make mischief your daily? The song is good enough on its own, and Kristen Chenoweth tries. Lord of Darkness how she tries. That woman is selling this number like Mephistopheles trying to meet his yearly quota. But I keep coming back to the fact that Maleficent never seemed like a character who would sing, let alone sing a vaudeville number complete with time step. Now we're gonna be evil. It's true, never gonna think twice. And we're gonna be spiteful. Again, though, they're totally kicking ass as Velma and Amber. Can't wait for December. So now that that Disney acid sequence is over, where is the wand and why can't they get it because there's still 80 minutes to go in the movie? Jake, don't! Wait, no, no, no! Oh, huh, because Jay is an idiot, apparently. Back at school, Fairy Godmother is giving the villain kids extremely condescending lessons in niceness. You find a vial of poison, do you A, put it in the king's wine, B, paint it on an apple, <laughs> or C, turn it over to the proper authority? I hope miscast Maleficent knocks you senseless. We're also introduced to Fairy Godmother's mousy daughter Jane, who Mal hits on as a potential in to getting the wand. Okay, I see where this is going. Mal butters Jane up and gives her magic makeovers while hinting she could do so much more with a proper wand, all the while growing truly close to Jane and becoming increasingly conflicted between doing her evil duty and betraying her friend, culminating in- plan work with Jane? Are you going over to see the wand? Do you think that I would be going through every single spell in this book if I hadn't completely struck out? 
or it could just be going absolutely nowhere. Sin number six, the stop-and-go plot development that makes up the majority of the movie. I think Descendants probably would have worked better as a series, in no small part because the way it's constructed makes it feel like it was cobbled together from one. While there is the overarching Get the MacGuffin plot, it frequently comes in second to the side plots for the main characters, which are put together in a sporadic and episodic fashion. As a result, the movie never gets any real momentum going, and nothing is developed very well. Example Evie uses the magic mirror to obviously cheat her way through her chemistry class. This gets the attention of Cinderella's handsome but douchey son, Chad, who just wants to use her to do his homework for him. The very next class scene, Chad rats Evie out because, insert reason here, but Doug comes to Evie's defense and she's given the chance to prove she can pass the chemistry exam without the aid of magic. Which she does. Hey, it turns out Evie was really smart all along, who knew? Not anyone who was expecting the movie to provide the information. However, the whole business is good for the one genuine laugh in the script. Are you stalking me? Technically, yes. And there's other side plots as well, like Jay discovering an innate talent for the Quidditch knockoff that passes for team sport in this universe. Ben! Carlos making friends with the school mascot. He doesn't look like a vicious rabbit pack animal. Mel giving everybody magical new hairstyles, which freaks Audrey out. Sure, it starts with the hair. Next thing you know, it's the lips and the legs and the clothes, and then everybody looks good, and then... Where will I be? Audrey, your mother was literally blessed with beauty and sweet pipes in her cradle. You shouldn't be throwing stones here. And, of course, they all learn about the wonderful things they missed out on by being raised in the ways of evil. Mostly things like strawberries and cookies. Wait, didn't your mom ever make you guys, like, chocolate chip cookies? Like, when you're feeling sad. Yeah, I'm here to tell you, our recruiting numbers would be way down if we'd gone with Come to the Dark Side, You Will Never Get Cookies Ever Again. Amid all this, we learn that the fairy godmother's wand is going to be used in Ben's upcoming coronation ceremony, and the only way Mal can get close enough to snatch it is if she usurps Audrey as Ben's girlfriend. So she whips up a love spell cookie and gets Ben to eat it with a little check-your-privilege guilting, and before you know it, Ben is going into a big song and dance about how crazy he is about her. My love is R-I-T-I-C-U-L-O-U-S Ridiculous. Let's go with that word, movie. Oh, and Audrey just up and decides to date Chad instead, so Mal is pretty neatly absolved of breaking her heart or anything like that. Time for the date sequence! Ready? Open. There's some nice things going on here, with Ben being all, you're not like your mother, and Mal being all, oh, I wish that were true, but I know it's the love potion talking, and good chemistry between the actors, and it's actually kind of interesting, which means it doesn't last. Don't know what I'm feeling. Is this just a dream? Oh, oh, yeah. If only I could read the This movie is long enough without throwing flashbacks into it. Anyway, Mal freaks out when Ben goes for a swim in the lake, requiring him to come to a rescue or whatever next scene. We've arranged for a special treat. Is it, is it? Can I please see a remote? Hang on. No, 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 go past this, past this part. In fact, never play this again. We've gotten to the part where the villain kids don't really want to go through the whole evil thing but feel they have to, and Mel decides she wants to break the love spell on Ben because she truly cares for him, and everyone's all sad and you'd think this was gearing up for the big climax, but instead, family day! Never second best. Movie, you, you come into my court, you disrespect my favorite Disney movie. Right, moving on. 
Mal ends up meeting Audrey's grandmother, which doesn't go well considering the latter is still bitter about the whole missing out on the first 16 years of my daughter's life thing. Chad joins in on the rampant villainism, a fight gets started, and as a result, everyone pretty much hates the villain kids now because reasons. Mal's just the bad girl infatuation. Yeah. I mean, he's never gonna make a villain a queen. Oh, good job, Disney. You've got your audience actively rooting for the bad guys to take over now. The coronation day arrives, and the villain squad is... sitting on the couch, eating popcorn, and snarking over the whole thing. Stuff of nightmares, right there. Oh, and it turns out Ben knew all about the love spell for a long time now. I can explain myself. <laughs> no, look, it's fine. I mean, you had a crush on me, I was with Audrey, you didn't trust that it could happen on its own. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> You're so right. So then how long have you known? Since our first date. Your spell washed away in the Enchanted Lake. For starters, Deus Ex Enchanted Lake, lousy plot development. Second, Ben, could you have come up with a more self-serving rationalization for Mal's actions? I mean, the last Disney character to cop that level of ego ended up falling off a tower after he stabbed your dad in the back. And by the way, don't you think that maybe this information would have been useful, oh, I don't know, when your girlfriend was feeling alone and miserable and thought she didn't have a single non-magically coerced friend in the world? And speaking of, could we have our wannabe villain characters actually deal with the consequences of being villainous? They get a lot of sins of the father and mother's crap from the other characters, but that's not quite the same thing. I have what you might call a perverse fascination with redemption stories, and an important part of that is actually doing something awful to need redemption from. The villain kids never do much that's all that bad, and the bad things they do are just shrugged off with, it's okay, he was in love with her all along, or she just needed to believe in herself, or they deserved it for being meanie pants. I mean, Ben catches more crap for his actual actions than any of the main characters do. This isn't their fault. No, son. It's yours. The villain kid's hands are even washed to the whole plotting to steal the wand thing, because before Mal can decide whether or not she's going to do it, Jane nicks the thing so she can magic herself pretty, accidentally dropping the Isle of the Lost Barrier in the process. Yes, that is the single stupidest plot twist you could have come up with. Mal gets a hold of the wand and is all, I have to be evil! And Ben is all, no, you can be good! And then Mal's all, okay, I want to be good then! And the other villain kids are all, yeah, good works. And I'm all, wasn't Maleficent supposed to teleport into this scene like five minutes ago? Even with the song and dance routine, that's got to be the most unmaleficent thing she's done this entire movie. Alas, not even Cheno's truly impressive display of honey-baked villainy can enliven the climax, nor can Maleficent transforming into a dragon, because, you know, that's worked so well for her in the past, as the big confrontation ultimately amounts to a staring contest. gets turned into a lizard. Something about having no love in her heart, just roll with it. The mean kids are all nice suddenly because nobody can miss the big dance party ending, and Mal inflicts the worst curse of all, a sequel hook. Oh, <laughs> I was having so much fun, I almost forgot. You didn't think this was the end of the story, did you? If you want an entertaining reimagining of classic Disney tropes with great songs, watch Enchanted again. If you want a movie with sluggish plotting, soon-to-be-dated songs, and some truly bizarre miscasting, watch Descendants. There is some decent effort put into the whole thing, and younger kids will probably find it entertaining enough. But the older you are and the closer you look at this movie, the harder it is to accept the entire premise. For starters, who were the other parents of the villain kids, and more importantly, what happened to them? Where did all these other people on the Isle of the Lost come from? Are they former henchmen? Were they a happy community before King Beast decided to relocate a bunch of villains onto their land? 
Why was Oridon's first ruler elected, but the crown passed on by primogeniture? Why did Jay and Carlos act like they've never tasted chocolate before in their lives, even though the very first thing Mal does is steal candy from a baby? Why was the security guard stationed in the middle of a big display room? And speaking of, shouldn't something as potentially dangerous as the enchanted spinning wheel be behind a glass case or at least a couple more velvet ropes? How did the most relentlessly nice heroine in the Disney canon raise such a douchebag son? Ben and Mal bond over their embarrassing middle names, but what are their last names? Why is the official sport of Fairyland a cross between lacrosse and American gladiators? Wasn't the fairy godmother a bit past childbearing age the last time we saw her? Whose idea was it to turn Belle and the Beast into dorky sitcom parents? But hey, I'm not done yet! I haven't delivered my punishments! I have such a nasty surprise waiting for the idiots who decided to do a rap version of...